Hello everyone, welcome to my talk about how to use virtual machine level tooling with language level ordinary object pointers. My name is Pierre Michelinabie and I work on this project with Theo Rugliano. And this presentation was published in the VMEL workshop at the Splash conference. So, who does not love tools? I'm gonna distinguish in this presentation the language level, which is basically the sources of your code, so what I write in Java, or in Python, or in Faro, because our experiments here are in Faro, and the VM level, so the virtual machine level, with, for the Java, for example, that's the Java virtual machine, the hotspot virtual machine, J9, JXRVM, etc. And, for example, the Faro virtual machine, which is, again, for Faro, because our experiments are on this programming language. At the source level, we actually have a lot of tools. I have noted here debuggers, profiler, compiler, code browser, XUnit, refactorings, project management, and so many more. However, when we move on to a virtual machine level, we have slightly less tools. We have, sorry, partic particularly, we have debuggers and profilers again, and some memory visualization tools. But these are difficult to write and require some expertise. In the case of Faro, the debugger is actually coded at the language level, so we don't really need the virtual machine to, machine to do that, and therefore, at the virtual machine level, we only have two tools. One debugger for the JIT compiler, so VM developer level concern, and a bootstrap to create the MetaObject protocol of Faro. So basically, tools that do not really interest Faro developers. And to explain why, Language level developers may need to use the VM level to define some tools. Let's take this small example. So this is a method that defines how the graphical user interface is executed in Faro. And we had a student with uh, and we had a student within our research group that was tasked with improving it. So what she did was adding a breakpoint in this method and explore around this method to see what was happening at the GUI level. And the thing is that when she closed the environment and tried to open it up again, nothing. We move on to the command line to get at least some kind of output on what is happening there, and we get this debug stack. So what we see in this debug stack is that we have triggered the breakpoint on a receiver that is a small integer, and particularly, this breakpoint is triggered in the method that I showed you right before. This tells us that the environment is frozen in the breakpoint and waiting for developer inputs to get further. So what happens is that the Faro environment is using this method while starting up to initialize the graphical user interface, and we cannot do anything to modify it, because we need access to the environment to do anything. At this point, what we need is the VM level support to fix this issue. So let's code VM level tools then. So the first thing that we need to do is find this class form in the memory uh, to find the corresponding method that is triggering the breakpoint and remove it, basically. So what happens in Sparrow is that we use memory snapshots to manage the environment that we can input either in the production Faro VM so VM that is used by every Faro developer every day, or we can input it in a simulated Faro VM which has nicer property to work on the VM. This is what Faro VM developers use basically every day. And this is a screenshot of part of the Faro image, so this is a memory dump again, and I found this string form there. Is this the class form? Actually, this is not. This is just a string representing the name of the class form. And this is binary. We cannot really read that binary without knowing how it was encoded first. So that's why we need the VM simulator. Because otherwise, it would probably take months or more of work. Before we get into the tooling part, what you need to know about the VM is that it is using ordinary object pointers, OOPs. And basically what this is, is a pointer to a memory location. At this address in memory, there is a header and this header defines how the following memory is read to make sense of it. In that case, these are three slots, which also contains OOP. Another possible layout of an OOP is the compiled method OOP, which we'll need later in this presentation. 
which is a bit more difficult to manage because there are a few slots there, but not all of them are OOPs. We cannot really just iterate over the slots and take each slot and look at the memory that it's referencing because not all of them are referencing memory. The slot particularly contains an extra header, so this is not an OOP, this is, this is an overheader that defines how the compile method behaves. Then we have literals, literals are OOPs, and then we have bytecodes, bytecodes are not OOPs either, and actually this is worse because they are 8-bit indexable, and therefore they contain between 1 and 8 bytecodes. And moreover, what's the order? Are the last bytecode at the last position? Is it at the first one? Where is the last one? This is a bit difficult to know when you do not know exactly how this is encoded and how the VM level works. Next, another example is now that I know about OOPs, I know about compile method, that's good, but I, I need to find that class. So I define, I'm trying to define a method there that finds a particular class which has a particular name. This is a complex method, don't dwell too much into the details, I will highlight the important points, of course. First, we have to iterate over the class table entries. So basically, the class table is an OOP that knows every class that is installed in the system. For each of these class, I need to find the class name, because we have multiple kinds of classes which do not have the same index for their class name. Then we need to get the class name index of that particular OOP, so get that slot at the VM level. We have next to convert it to a string of the host environment. And finally, we can compare it to the class name that we had as argument. If the class names match, then we can return the OOP. Otherwise, we just return nil OOP. And if I execute this on a given memory, uh, 4 million, 400, I don't know. This is too complicated for me to read. I, after three digit, four digit, I'm, I'm blacking, blacking out. And at this point, I'm wondering whether what I got here is the nil object. Is it the class object? I don't really know. This is a bit difficult to read and to reason about. And what I want to highlight there is the knowledge gaps that a Faro developer would encounter while trying to do this at the VM level. First, I mentioned the class table entry. This is hidden completely from the language level developer. They do not know about this at all. Next, we have a low-level style, which is a bit difficult to manage for people that mainly write object-oriented code. And we have an OOP-based API. This API does not differentiate between the different kinds of OOPs, and therefore they are a bit difficult to manage also for our developers. And uh, the last thing is, of course, that we have OOPs. Faro developers never work with addresses, they only work with objects. This is a very wide gap for them to bridge. So to recap, the issues that I have highlighted so far are that we use ordinary object pointers, we use an API manipulating OOPs, and we use VM level information only. Language level ordinary object pointers. This is trying to complement this issue first by changing OOP's manipulation with language level entities. So in the case of Faro, these are objects. We prevent the developer from seeing the API manipulating OOP's by identifying and typing OOP's, which provides them with specific APIs for their kind of OOP's. And finally, we bridge the VM and language level by imbuing the language level OOP's with both VM and language level information. And to do that, what we have to do is first iterating the memory. To iterate the memory, what we do is we take the first OP in memory, we take a look at how big it is thanks to the header, and we offset the OOP by its size to get the second one. This is because the full VM uses only OOPs. There are nothing else in the memory space that it manages. So this is good, we can move between OOPs. But then we need to identify each OOP and to understand what kind of OOPs they are. So for example, for each OOP we wonder, is it a class, a meta class, a free object maybe, or something else? And if there is no particularity for this OOP, then this is an instance of a class. This is the basic kind of OOPs for Faro objects. We identify these OOPs and we put them in an identified memory. 
this can be a cache or simply a layer that is used to understand what kind of OPs there are every time. And instead of basing the tools on the OOPs directly, we base them on the identified memory, which provides a layer of abstraction over the memory. And this allows us to write tools. So let's take a look at a very basic one first. I can ask an identified memory for all its classes. I do not need to know that there is a VM level entity that is called the class table that knows them. I can ask for a particular verified class, meta class here. I can get the class side of each classes that I have. Or more funky things that we can do is try to use Faro level tools. For example, one of the experiments that we run was uh, to take all of the objects that were in the identified memory, take only the compiled method OPs, and for each of them, we try to decompile them with the Faro language decompiler. When there is an error, we simply return nil and we say we, didn't, we weren't able to decompile it. So far, we are able to decompile most of the Faro image methods. Faro developers love to have inspectors that show them what kind of objects they are manipulating. So we have written inspectors for all of our OOPs. We can see at first the VM level information, particularly the address of the object, its OOP class tag, so the index at which the class is installed in the class table, the format of this object. And we also have language level concerns, particularly the literals or the class OOP. So next, we have wanted to try to do a kind of memory visualization for fun. And what we did is we took every OOP and we created a box for each of them. Particularly, this memory is meant for IoT development. And you can see that there are about 3,000 entities. For reference, a basic Faro image has around 900,000 OOPs. So this is very small. And from this, we can do other stuff. Particularly, we can evaluate whether this memory is good or not for IoT as it was meant to be. And we can particularly scale each box representing each OOP by its size. And the first thing that we can see is that we have four boxes that take most of the space in the memory. And we wonder what they are, because why do we need these big boxes? Can we reduce them to get in an even smaller runtime? So first we have a class table and the class table pages that are in the class table that manage the classes installed in the system. And we also have the remember set, which is also a VM level only entity. So all of this is VM level only. From this, we can give the advice that if someone wants to get an even smaller runtime, it probably needs to work on the VM constraints rather than the language level. And by simply naming objects that are known at the VM level, we actually found a bug in a VM level tool. The special object array, instead of being at the start of a memory, was at the end of a memory. We were able to find it very easily because apparently this is the only object that has 60 slots. And we can see that this is nowhere near what it should be. And the problem here is that if it moves in memory, the interpreter may break. Next, we did another kind of memory visualization. We simply wanted to have a browser allowing us to see what classes were installed in the memory. And from this class, we wanted to be able to get the methods that are installed in this class. And particularly, you may have noticed that this is not a random class here. This is form, the class that we actually had an issue with right before. And this is the method that was actually bugged. So this is what is called a meta error. Basically, I want to do something as a developer and the environment throws an unrelated error because of a bug. In that case, this is the GUI that is just broken. So now that we have been able to find this method kind of randomly while doing tools, what we can do is try to patch it. So we look first at how it looks. So the, by the first bytecode is the one of the broken version. The next one is the one of a clean version representing the same code. And in the literals, we can see that there is one more literal in the corrupted version on the left. So what we did was to patch the bytecode by 
removing those free bytecodes and fix the indexes that are also wrong. And we just remove a little by replacing each little with the next one, which allowed us to get a method that was working. To get a sense of how useful that was, I want to point out that during this, I did not touch the VM level knowledge. I just said I don't want these free bytecodes there. So I remove part of the bytecodes of the compile method layer, which is very complicated to work with. And I remove the literal by iterating over the literals only, not over all the slots. I was able to fix this student image that was completely broken with three days of work on it by simply patching the method. And it took me about an hour, most of it being simply loading the faro image inside the environment. Okay, next. I want to show you another real-world bug that we have in images. Uh, this is how we work with corrupted memory. What happens is that if there is a bug inside the garbage collector, it may change a value unexpectedly, and therefore the memory might be corrupted. A corruption means that I am not able to read the memory properly, and therefore I am not able to do anything else. The environment is broken. Our process still relies on iterating the memory, so we try to do this, but at some point, we get to a corrupted OP, and we cannot really know what is after. So what we get is a memory that has a few OPs at first, and then complete blank. We are not able to know what OPs there are after that point. So we need to rely on another method to iterate the memory, that is actually slower. It's uh, by using the slot. So Every time we have an OOP that is not corrupted, we iterate over its slot and we try to get information about other OOPs that are elsewhere in memory. And if there is a slot that references a corrupted object, we simply ignore it and we say that this reference is broken as well. At this point, we have been able to track the corruption and to reduce it to the smallest amount of object that we could. And we just have to cleanse this corruption by putting free OOPs instead of OOPs. So we may lose some data, but we are able to recover the environment that was broken, and more importantly, to recover the work that was stuck inside that environment. Moreover, it gives us a lot of information about the corruption, although we were not able to track down where this corruption was coming from because of the time that we got to work on this. And the important point is that in that case, it's a bit more difficult to differentiate between our tool and the, uh, our tool and how we fixed the memory corruption, because we still needed to modify some kind of things in the VM level information. And particularly, we needed to patch the references, and we need also to um, and we also needed to iterate over the slots of each object to find which of them were OOPs and to check whether they were referencing bad memory. And this allowed us to focus on how the corruption affected the memory, rather than to think about how to patch the references or to iterate over the slot. And also, one could make the case that our tool should be able to handle any kind of memory, even corrupted one. So this is a bit in between levels. To summarize, and in conclusion, tooling at the VM level is difficult, particularly because it's not manipulating the same kind of entities the language level developer is aware about. And we propose to bridge knowledge gaps with language level ordinary object pointers, particularly because they are language level entities, in our case, objects. It's based on identifying and typing the OOPs and by mixing the language and VM level informations, so we have access to everything rather than only part of it. You have the paper QR code on the right and the GitHub QR code on the left. Thank you for watching. And if you have any question, you can of course comment or you can send me a mail.